And and could you tell us? I mean, where, how many have you got now? Because I know you've just done one in Iceland, haven't you? I know someone's just gone over there. So it's in yeah, Iceland. Iceland started it just about a year ago. Um, we're we're about 140 events now. Wow. 120 of those are in the United Kingdom, and then we're in Australia, Denmark, Iceland, Poland. Uh, USA starts on Saturday, and South Africa. We're, we're talking to people in France and Germany and Canada as well. That's absolutely incredible. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, starting in another country is a whole new story. I mean, it's, uh, you know, the Parkrun <laughs> brand, Parkrun brand, people don't like the use of the word brand, but it, it's a fact. When, when you sign up to do Parkrun, you know that there are people giving up their own free time to make this happen. Uh, you also know that there are sponsors who are giving us money so that we can build the technology, deploy these new events, and to keep the whole thing running. And the balance is to make sure that the sponsors don't commercialize Park Run. Yeah. So we have all sorts of rules that say they can't sell to the Park Run base, but they can inform and they can educate, they can advise and um, they can offer. And there are things that we do on that side. But, you know, as soon as we go somewhere new, like, uh, say, America, and we establish Parkrun, if we haven't done the basics right, like, for instance, setting up the not-for-profit entity to make sure that there's whatever money is generated in Parkrun stays in Parkrun, then I think it's open to abuse. Mm -hmm. And if, if it gets abused at any one of these locations across the world, I think that can draw the whole of Park Run back down again. So as, as wonderful as it, as it sounds, you know, it sounds all you're doing is you're creating these free runs all over the world, but there are so many people out there who are looking to take advantage of something like Park Run. People who want to build, you know, create t-shirts and sell them with the Park Run logo on and we don't allow that. So there are all sorts of things, all sorts of principles that we're trying to uphold. And I suppose starting in a new country is not a simple task at all. It's quite complex. And at what point did you give up your, your mainstream job? I, did, I gave up uh, in 2010. So um, I realized very early on uh, that this would need some full-time employment. It would need some people to... to administer what we're doing, but also to, to work with new events to, to start that. And at the time, I was a, a fairly well-paid consultant. Uh, I was spending my own money developing Parkrun as well, but for me to give up uh, would have meant I would have needed loads of money to come in from sponsorship. And of course, the sponsorship model has only evolved since 2007, and it's been a long, hard slog to get sponsors to understand what Parkrun is and how it works versus the paid races that people do. And, uh, and so that wasn't possible. So in 2008, I hired my first employee, a chap called Chris Wright, who uh, did a multitude of things, but primarily looked after our systems and answered people's queries and, and built new parts of the technology. And then in 2009, I hired Anita, who's a, a Francophile, and Anita was brought on specifically to bring on new events, um, to take them through the process of why do you want this event, who are the people going to be involved, where we need permission, we've got to go and speak to the council, and so on and so forth. And so she did that uh, very successfully in her first year. And it was only in 2010, actually I thought I had secured another contract with a, another sponsor, and as a result, I resigned my job, and uh, at about the same time, that, whoops, <laughs> at about the same, the same time, that sponsor pulled out, and so I was left having given up my job, but also having to make ends meet. But, you know, it's all worked out for the best. Um, I, uh, you know, I'm not paid now what I was paid when I was a consultant, and I'm sure the park run staff, the employees, could earn more money if they went on to the commercial market. But we do it primarily because we love it. But, yeah. um, 
but also because we know we're doing the right thing. We're doing good things for the community. We're doing good things for people. And we feel good about ourselves most days. So That's, yeah. that's fantastic. Yeah. And so if you were to meet someone that's kind of um, in that space you were at midlife and struggling to believe it's possible to create something different, to, to start doing more of what you love, what advice would you give to them from where you are now? Well, you know, the, the difficult thing is reality versus <laughs> of course. what you think might be. I reckon... You know, every one of these conversations needs to be peppered with um, research and understanding. It also has to be driven by the individual's self-determination. And by that I mean, you know, loads of people told me I couldn't do this. Loads of people said it would never work. Loads of people said that the business model doesn't exist, and that's possibly true. But I was always of the opinion that if we did the right thing, it would work. I wasn't 100% certain how, but over the years I've taken one step forward every single time. And, uh, and most of the decisions we've made have been good decisions. So I would say to this individual, uh, be real. Yeah. Be prepared to suffer a little bit and try and work out what that means and what those parameters are, both in terms of cost and time and effort. But if it's a goal that you want to achieve, then you've got to go for it, and you've got to strive to make it happen. And the harder uh, you work at it, the more chance you have of making it work. Paul, thank you so much. Um, it's an incredibly inspiring story, and... Um I know how many lives you touch through Park Run. Seriously, you know. Thank you. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm delighted. You know, I, you know, for me, I, I sleep well at night primarily because uh, it's not necessarily because there are people out there running who I know are improving their lives, but it is also because I know there are so many volunteers who are giving up their time because they want to. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's incredible. Uh, you know, we have this self-perpetuating volunteer success story. We have people who are, are coming to us all the time and saying, I've been volunteering for a year at my own park run, now I want to have my own one. I want to run it, I want to leave it. And, and that, you know, it's those stories that I think are unbelievable. They're just incredible and that means that we're doing something right yeah it kind of puts your faith in human nature too doesn't it <laughs> parkrun has completely sorted that for me because i you know i think going through the bad patch in the 30s i i learned not to trust people mm -hmm. and uh i have to say that i've been proven completely wrong by the people in parkrun there are so many good people out there who want to do their little bit for their family, for their community, and f for Park Run. And it's just, it's happening all the time. Yeah. So we are, we are self perpetuated and that's brilliant. And, and I mean, I just think the other thing that's really cool is that it does ripple across families. So I was someone that thought I could never run because I was asthmatic, and Phyllis Flynn was the one that got me going. And... Um, and, you know, it's just that whole thing of now my kids run, my dog runs, you know, <laughs> and it's, that's the impact you have. You know, it's like a, a, a pebble in a pond. So well, Your story is a common one. <laughs> and I'm very, very pleased about that because there are loads of families whose lives have changed because of this. And that's great. Yeah. That's great. Thank, well, you, thank you, so you so much, much for your time. It's a pleasure. No, I really enjoyed that. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you. Okay. You have a good evening. Thanks. Bye.